Hi everyone, my name is Mike. I'm a professional pixel artist and this is going to be a quick uh, feedback uh, sort of tutorial uh, for this image here created by an artist named Juan Pablo Rosa who belongs to a Facebook uh, a group for pixel art uh, called, ironically enough, Pixel Art. Uh, so uh, I do not have time to script or edit this, so my apologies if I get rambly. I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. But this is the image that I'm going to be making uh, suggested edits on and explain uh, as I go. So without further ado, let's load this into... Also, my apologies, the uh, neighbors are doing construction downstairs, so it might get noisy. Uh, hopefully not. But anyway, so I'm going to load this into ProMotion. Uh, the image I was given was saved as a 24-bit PNG image, which means it was not indexed color. Uh, that and the fact that this pixel art image is using a massive amount of extremely similar colors tells me right off the bat that this artist is not yet accustomed to using a program dedicated to pixel art. Uh, and because of that, um, it, it's causing some some problems. Uh, a lot of times, beginner pixel artists they're going to they're going to be sort of fighting with the fact that they're using modern tools designed predominantly for high resolution, full color image manipulation, and they're using it for pixel art. And they're occasionally accidentally using features that are creating semi transparent or alpha blended. Uh, brush strokes, which are creating this massive amount of colors uh, that are um, really going against what pixel art is. Um, and to explain that better, uh, and that's that's really going to slow you down and hinder your ability to uh, eventually ach achieve a nice, clean pixel art image. So to go into a tiny bit of the history of uh, pixel art, Keep in mind, pixel art exists because of the technological limitations of uh, computers and especially game consoles in the past. And uh, it's those very limitations that created the art form uh, known as pixel art. And um, so if you're not using a tool that helps you enforce those same sorts of limitations, it's very easy for things to get uh, sort of out of hand and for it to start adding too many colors and, and non-hand done alpha blending and all of those or anti-aliasing I should say and all of those sorts of things and um, in most consoles and computers the movable characters and special effects in a game were called sprites and there was special dedicated hardware graphics hardware for sprites and by the 16-bit era the general limitation for a given sprite was 16 colors so that, that's another aspect of the, uh, the sort of appearance of legitimate pixel art is that you're using a very limited number of uh, what are called color indexes or indices. Um, as you can see, sure enough, I found this sprite rip from the internet. Uh, my thanks and apologies to Capcom for using this without their permission. Uh, please be gentle. Um, you can see there's a background color and then 15 colors to actually use for the art itself. And um, so what uh, pro pixel artists would do and needed to do back in the day, they were forced to do, is create a palette either first or as they go within that limitation of 16, typically 16 colors uh, for a particular character um, or object. So another important aspect of this is very often in, in um, classic console and arcade games, you would have situations where they don't have a lot of storage space, they don't have a lot of memory. So in order to give you, give you more visual variety in the game, what they could do is they could use a different set of colors for that same sprite. So if you look here, like just as a quick example, you can see how there's a nice clean range of reds of the sort of golden color that's shared between the gloves and the hair. And then there's the skin color. And none of these ranges share colors with any of the other ranges. And then you have black for the belt and eyebrows. We know you dye your hair, Ken. And then uh, white 
for the um, for the I, and I don't think that white is used anywhere else. We can do a quick check to find out. Let's change that. Yep, it's only changing in the I. So yeah, so uh, one of the reasons to design your palette really clean and organized this way is that now we have the option. So I'm going to go in here. By the way, I'm using ProMotion NG, which is a fantastic pixel art program. So I can select a range like so of colors, and then I can adjust the hue and saturation and so on. And you can see this is how they allowed for other color variations. Let's say both players in a in a game like Street Fighter Alpha. Um, let's say they each pick the same character. Well, you don't want the two characters to look identical, so they would do what's called a palette swap, where they'd be using the same sprite data, but they would be telling that sprite to use a different set of sixteen colors. Uh, and so that's how you get your color variation. So that's another good thing to keep in mind when you're doing pixel art. The sooner you learn uh, the sort of technical constraints and why those uh, constraints are good to follow, um, the sooner you'll be able to emulate better, really legitimate looking pixel art. And it just helps things stay very organized. It allows you to change things to come up with other color schemes for your character as you're working very quickly. So here is uh, Juan's um, image as it appeared. As you can see the difference. Let me go back to this. 16 colors arranged into very clean ranges that do not share colors with everything else. This is, you know, it doesn't get more legit pixel art than, than that. And then we have uh, his image where he's clearly using modern tools not designed specifically for pixel art. And um, it's going to get very messy to edit this image. There's so many images, uh, different colors to pick from. You're going to end up either creating even more colors if you keep using uh, a program like Photoshop, for example, or GIMP. The odds are you're going to just keep adding more and more almost identical colors into the mix. Uh, sort of going further and further away from pixel art as you work, which is the opposite of what you want. Um, so I really recommend getting used to uh, great programs that are designed specifically for pixel art and work in what's called indexed color mode, which you can see here. Uh, in this case, in most indexed color painting pro uh, programs, you can use up to 256 color indices uh, or indexes, but uh, typically, like I said, for a character, you want to limit it to 16 colors. There goes the construction, my apologies, and um, keep things organized. But anyway, so I started doing a quick color reduction, and I just wanted to show how that sort of process works to uh, get your, your project, uh, st start to clean it up so that you can work cleanly in indexed color mode. I think it'll help a lot. And so the way I started was I just did a very, um, I can go into colors, reduce colors, and then start at something relatively safe. So, so let's say like 48 colors because it's already using like over 100. Uh, so let's say 48 and let's just see how it does. And as you can see, there was virtually no visible change to the human eye between that uh, 128 colors being used and 48. And then what you can also start to do is go into a tool like this. And now I can arrange my palette. Uh, let's see here. Um, functions. Uh, sort by brightness, hue, color, saturation, and so on. We'll try color at first, and then I will remap the image and go back to the standard RGB slider. And now this really helps you see how incredibly close a lot of these remaining colors are together. And then you can start copying one to the other. And then just keep an eye on your image uh, to see if there's a change that you don't like. So for example, I'm going to just copy this color. I'm going to press the C key and copy here. And there was no visible change. And then these two are incredibly similar. I'm going to just copy that one to that one. And there was no visible change. And I would just keep doing this as much as possible and always checking to make sure there's no sort of visual uh, degrading of the, um, the final result. 
and so then you would end up with um, you'd end up with your uh, work with a bunch of duplicate colors and then for safety's sake I'm going to grab this I think I have a feature turned off grabbing it as a brush and putting it here for safekeeping um, but then I can choose colors remove duplicate colors and blacken and then I should be able to remap but if that doesn't yeah that's not working but luckily I have the brush so I can just go brush oh no colors remap colors brush and that gives me back it remaps the brush to to fix it to use the um, to stop using those black indexes and to use the duplicates that we had um, had created if that makes sense so you would keep doing this process to whittle down your palette and get it under control but especially for a character that's pretty darn monochromatic or dual chromatic here you should not have much trouble with this process or if you had started from the beginning to get it all the way down to a 16 color palette and remember that's one background color and then uh, 15 colors to work with uh, so I'm just going to close that and like I said I had started I got down to under 32 colors here but just an, another example of sort of manual um, uh, color editing or color reduction to get down to a like a more legitimate pixel art palette uh, you can do stuff like ask yourself well where is this particular color index used and you can just temporarily change it and you can see that's only used in the beard and then you can ask yourself is it really important to have a color that's only in the beard much like Ken his hair color was shared with the glove color um, or color range uh, you could make it so that um, you know like the beard was the same color as this underclothing here or something like that and then when you created alternate colors for the character uh, alternate color schemes the character keeps a balance so to speak um, because one color that's used somewhere is used usually in at least one other place um, so there's there's that suggestion I think I spotted here's a great example of a color you can get rid of so here we have a color that is only used in the shadow side of one of the two horns um, so that's another sort of thing to look out for but I'm not going to I don't have the time to work it all the way down to a 16 color palette I just wanted to point that out now I'm going to um, get into the actual suggested edits sorry it took me so long to get to this point uh, for the artwork itself and I'm just going to go with what stands out as the most glaring problems um, and then work to more minute and nitpicky things so the most glaring thing a professional artist an art director the very first thing they're going to see uh, don't get me wrong they're going to see this issue and this image and and think this is pretty good this artist has a lot of potential with some good uh, art direction and a little bit of training they will be a very strong pixel artist uh, especially if they didn't receive it in 128 colors uh, but that's an easy thing to fix once you know about it um, but anyway the biggest issue is this arm here in the background uh, there's a, a lack of uh, a bit of knowledge in both perspective in especially especially what's called foreshortening uh, which is especially relevant to limbs of a body when you're drawing them in perspective uh, and anatomy itself and the end result is a uh, extremely long forearm uh, here and the way this needs to be fixed is to understand that when the arm let's see if I can get this on camera here. so when you bend your arm back like this there we go so even if a glove or a gauntlet goes all the way down it has to stop here or you're not going to be able to bend your arm so it would stop here and you'd still see the person's elbow as flesh if they if they have exposed elbows so you can see what the problem was here the artist wanted more extreme foreshortening kind of like uh, boy it's really hard to get it on camera sorry about that sort of like this 
but that's the exact opposite of the angle. He's got the X behind his back, so it would be like this. So because he's doing this perspective for the elbow and this perspective for the, uh, the, the what the position has to be, he's got a very elongated forearm. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to give him back his actual elbow. We're going to erase this. And like I said, I don't have time to make this really clean, but hopefully, despite it being kind of rough, the uh, it'll still make sense. All right. So that gives him back his elbow. And it's still too long. The arm, the forearm is still too long, but we're getting at least appropriate, um, we're starting to get at least appropriate uh, perspective. So then we we'll bring back this kind of fur detail here to the edge of the glove and then cast that shadow there. Um, and then, so that helps a lot, but we still have an issue with this, with this hand. So th this arm right here was by far the weakest part of the, uh, and the only thing that really stands out as a uh, very uh, non-professional level. So uh, once we get this fixed, uh, it'll really make a big difference. Um, so here you have an issue that a lot of beginner artists have where they, um, they know that in general, get on the camera, we know that in general this is what a closed hand looks like. So then they, they, draw, they draw this fist and then they draw even a very thick handled thing coming out of that. And of course it can't work that way your hand needs room to be clutching that stick. So the thumb opens and goes sort of downward and your, uh, your fingers have to extend up. There needs to be room within that palm for your fingers to wrap around that object. And he tried to compensate by that by making the fingers up higher, but because the, the forearm is already too high, um, you have this further problem extending this already overly long forearm if that makes sense. So what we will do is we'll just grab this whole fist and we're going to move it down a couple of pixels. Or at least one pixel. Let's see how that looks. And yeah, now the size of that form is making a lot more sense. Zoom out a bit. That's also a good habit to have. And if we want to, we can always tweak it and bring this back down a pixel or two. Sorry about that. There we go. So start to make more uh, minute corrections. And then the other thing that I was going to get to was the handle of the axe. Uh, I understand and appreciate it's very likely this axe was not made in a factory by machines so that it could be very irregular in shape. But in general, for the sake of uh, clean and non-confused or perspective that doesn't look like mistakes, uh, it's a good idea to try to keep things more consistent, especially since the head of the axe should be going back into the depth, um, into the distance. It would make a lot of sense to continue the general arc of things and not let it get too fat here. And then we can trim this also if we need to, to make that work. And you can see that's a much more graceful um, continuous shape that doesn't fight against the perspective as much. It's still getting fatter instead of thinner as it goes into the distance, but it doesn't go back so far that that's a big problem and uh, as I said it could be a fairly irregular shape though keep in mind in general the handle of something often gets fatter toward the base at the bottom and not th thinner toward the bottom um, but anyway what we definitely can afford to do is make this stay thicker as we get to the fingers and then we're going to raise up the fingers here and especially raise up the 
finger here and move down the thumb like it's really you know just try help it look like it's going around this uh, around this handle more and then make the handle actually go into the palm something like this and like I said I don't have time to really perfect things and also we can taper this wrist a little bit it was getting too fat so that we have a more organic shape and then I'm going to make the form a little thicker on this side just to give it more organic shape all right so that right there that fixed the big glaring issue uh, but now we're going to get into even more subtle uh, anatomy um, and the second biggest issue of this image was the this here um, which is this belt or sash going I think that's the word going across the chest keep in mind if it's this low on the shoulder over here it's going to keep slipping down and he's going to go nuts <laughs> constantly having to slide it back up so these would always be behind the peak of the shoulder and not on the over here and then so we're going to have to erase that from there and then fix the position of this buckle to compensate better here there we go and again my apologies i don't have time to really clean this up perfectly but you get the idea we'll just give it some kind of detail like that um, and you might notice I squint sometimes when I that's also an old habit from fine art painting uh, traditional painting with um, you know like on canvas um, intentionally squinting lets you see the overall shape and detail uh, or lack of detail, the overall shape and use of color and, and stuff like that without getting too distracted by specific details. But anyway, so, and then the other issue, I mean, that already helped a lot, but the other issue is let's make sure that there's a really a feeling of this chest being nice and I'll put a temporary line on, on there, something nice and bright. You, you really want to feel like this guy's really got a kind of broad barrelly chest like it should come out like this if that makes sense like the central line of his chest would be something like this and then his pecs would be here and his shoulder would be here his other shoulder would be here bicep this bicep is too low we'll get to that later but you get the idea like we want to uh, really emphasize his um the three-dimensionality of his chest and one way to help do that a little bit is bring this down a bit more before it starts cutting over. Uh, you know, it's kind of, it's, its direction is forced to sort of make room for the, uh, the, um, the girth of his, his chest, his pectoralis and upper rib cage area. So there's that. And then, um, the other thing is that if you have like a big kind of uh, what is that called um, poncho type thing uh, over your uh, shoulders when you raise your arm it's going to it's going to slide back to make room for the bicep quite a bit uh, so that could look nice if we if we do that oops switch to the wrong drawing mode sorry about that um, so let's just give that a try and also you've got the bicep peaking sort of in the wrong place peaking means where it is the most pointy um, so let's sort of make it do that and then we can potentially get rid of that there and then we could actually create some more depth to this poncho type thing and make it clear what it's doing that it's making room for the bicep and then you can you can decide how massive you want the uh, 
want this guy's muscles to be, and then there would be better delineation under that bicep. There we go. And there should be another shadow color. I think this is, oh, good. Okay, so you have a, a darker shadow color so we can emphasize the anatomy under that bicep better. There you go. So that fixes that up quite a bit. Uh, I'm getting nitpicky here. I shouldn't waste so much time, but cast a better shadow under that as well to help that stand out. All right, so that's all feeling a lot better now. Those were the really big issues. Um, another thing that if this ax is going back into the distance like that, keep in mind perspective and keep in mind that where the ax joins the, um, the sort of metal part that goes, that connects into the wood, it's thick to give it strength and then it tapers eventually to a hopefully close to razor fine point but you really should have that thickness represented here and not here so you were doing the opposite of what you should have done right and then we can even further emphasize that thickness and that taper with a an edge um, a highlight on the edge which is pretty typical for metallic things there we go and then you could even do a, a sort of quintessential cartoonist style diagonal um, highlight across the blade so i'm not going to um, work too hard to per perfect that but i think you get the general idea and then i just made this bit of detail disappear so we'll bring that back But anyway, that's the general idea. Um, all right, so now the other thing is that when you're shading cylinders, especially metallic cylinders, it's a really good idea to have, especially if you have room for it in the given size, have that reflected light edge as well. And that's going to help it look more like a shiny metallic, shiny metallic object. Alrighty. Uh, all right. Now to more um, uh, the next thing on the list, I would say that stands out is you got this really cool uh, sort of cod piece ornament here, uh, the skull, and there's. Um, in general, it's really important, especially when you're doing pixel art, which is inherently, I'm going to save my progress in case my computer crashes or something. <clears throat> it's really important to keep this concept in mind. When you're doing pixel art, in general, the image is quite small. And the two most important things for a video game or a character in pixel art is what you call readability, which means even at a glance, even if there's a lot going on in the background, can I easily recognize the character? Can I recognize the attributes of the character, the, the details that make that character specifically him or her? And then can you see the silhouette, which what position is that character in? So you have a nice strong silhouette and you have, even though the character is overwhelmingly sort of brown and reddish brown, because you used contrast and value, which is light versus dark, you can still see quite nice uh, separation of the different parts of the character, which is great. And you didn't overcomplicate it with too much little tiny details, which is also excellent uh, design decision. Um, uh, but keep in mind this general idea. If a detail or um, an ornament is worth having, uh, then it's worth uh, emphasizing or exaggerating. So you certainly made that decision with the horns uh, on the Viking's helmet. Those would be very cumbersome in an actual battle, but this isn't real. This is pixel art and, you know, presumably video game graphics. And you're the animator. You get to make sure when he swings his axe, he never gets it caught up in his own, you know, sends his own helmet flying off of his head because he swung and the horn was in the way and all that stuff. So that's all, that's all great. Um, but when you get into very subtle uh, 
nuances, they can often look like mistakes or bad art instead of a subtle nuance. And what I'm talking about specifically is this cod piece. It's not quite centered. And not only is it not quite centered, it's so close to being centered that the fact that it's not centered just looks like a mistake. It doesn't look like, oh, it's just intentionally off-centered. So let me show you, let me show you the difference. Um, so I'm just going to grab this. Here it is. So let's say we move it all the way over here. Then it's extremely obvious. that it's intentionally off-center, okay? It makes the character less symmetrical, uh, and that could work. Um, but a lot of times in video games, most of the times in video games, when the character flips around, it just literally flips those graphics. So uh, the more blatantly not symmetrical the character, uh, the more that could annoy certain people. But what my suggestion actually would be is to just fix this and make it actually centered. And that's going to do two things. One, it's going to make the fact that it's you know not centered be a non-issue because it will be centered. Uh, so therefore, it, it won't look like your art just has a mistake. Um, but even better, now you have a better feeling of depth because now the cod piece is overlapping the uh, the sort of edge of this um, hip guard. All right, so it, it increases the sense of three dimensionality and it repairs the fact that it did not look centered. Also, by cons comparison, this is really nitpicky now, but by comparison, that hip was sticking out uh, a little too far. And you see what I just did there. This is another really good thing to keep in mind with silhouette. Uh, again, if you have a detail, it's good to emphasize that detail. If it's worth having, it's worth really getting the full mileage from that aspect of design. So you'll see, because we have this fur, the problem here with the fur is it, it just it follows the same exact outline, the same exact stroke of the bicep, which again, is it goes too low. Uh, and it doesn't stick out in the back here either. So your image will definitely improve if you let that fur detailing exist on its own. And it may go up too high here. That's very possible. Let's just bring it down a little bit. But you get the idea. Let that have its, let it take up its own space, let it have its own silhouette. Uh, and then if you want, you can beef up this guy, uh, this guy's forearm a little bit, let it taper to a thinner wrist by comparison to make him feel, again, more muscular and more natural curvy shapes. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this stuff here, but yeah, just, uh, there we go. All right, that's fine for now. And then uh, that is by far, that's the vast majority of suggested changes. Um, it, it is worth the time. Think about that. Try getting down to a 16 color palette. Try working out um, using only specific indexes or indices, only specific color ranges for specific things so that you could quickly come up with alternate um, color variations of the character like just having that mindset and approaching it that way will really help you if uh, you're don't have the time at the moment or you're too intimidated to switch over to a uh, specific a tool like promotion which is specifically geared toward making pixel art then at the very least what you should do when you start creating a character is you can create with a uh, in in photoshop Make sure you have the pencil tool instead of the brush tool selected. That way you'll have nothing but nice, clean, solid pixels with no fuzziness and, and blurring, creating all those extra colors. And then you can just create yourself. So let's say for this um, um, 
poncho sort of thing. I can't think of the actual word for it. Uh, but you would actually create your range here and say, okay, these are the colors for this and this. Okay, and then you would do the same thing for the gloves, right? So you'd have this color, this color. Uh, I don't know if it gets any way. Yeah, we'll just, oops. Yeah, that's the same color. Okay, there it is. I knew there was a medium color. And then this color. Then you can do the same thing with this. You've got the fur colors. Just create your palette like this. And then when you're working, even if you're working in a program like um, Photoshop, always be using the pencil tool at 100% opacity. And always pick your colors by holding the Alt key in Photoshop. Always pick your colors by, um, by holding the Alt key and clicking directly on one of these colors in your sort of handmade swatches uh, color palette that you created for yourself that'll help you avoid creating all those extra colors and help you think okay these are color ranges that I'm using for very specific parts of the image uh, and that should help you a lot and that, that's that's about oh there are some other really nitpicky things this um, be careful of this arrow I know you were trying to drop a shadow here but because you have this dark line of the shaft of the arrow and then it just stops going up on that angle and then goes pretty much straight across it's just creating the illusion that the arrow is sagging so uh, it's worth it to um, just be careful of that and bring up that uh, shadow color at least a bit and that will help get rid of the illusion that it's sagging might even be worth it to just go all out and uh, let's see here yeah something like that is better it looks less saggy um, but yeah that's it I mean at that point it's getting pretty nitpicky uh, it looks like you've made some uh, specific uh, design decisions oh one other thing uh, while we're here careful how you render things um, or shade things how many different colors you've got a lot of needlessly sort of extra colors going on in this beard for one thing but the other thing is uh, you can simultaneously shade and give a sense of the type of uh, texture that something has If you take a little more time and now now that way the beard also feels like it's following the form of not only the beard itself but lying across uh, a broad chest there we go maybe hit some highlights there's something called specularity um, the um, uh, shiny things they're more specular which means the sort of area of highlight on it when you're shading it uh, comes to very distinct very sharp small areas of highlight uh, so keep that in mind um, let me see your lighting source is coming from the upper right uh, be careful with edge lighting when you're not dealing with really or rim lighting when you're not dealing with really large artwork with a lot of pixels it's a little dangerous to have uh, edge lighting on something so small because it's going to start to make it look flat and kind of like those puffy stickers instead of really giving you the volume that you want on something like a helmet so just as an example let's kill that um, edge lighting and move the highlight over here and then push that shadow back to a little bit maybe expand that and I don't think there's a brighter color but let's say we had an almost white color Could hit a highlight something like this and then now you've got the uh, something more accurate to the specularity of a helmet I don't know if you can see that that helped with the the sense of shininess and three-dimensional three-dimensionality is that a word at the same time so then I just did the same thing as we did here with the uh, sort of reflected light edge and Let's see. 
So right now I'm being really nitpicky, but you get the idea. So now that helmet is really starting to feel simultaneously shiny and like it has volume. And then you made the decision to not render the actual eyes, even though they would be visible here. So just be careful if you're going to do that, it's typically a good idea to make sure you shadow it out quite a bit so that it makes it more sense that you're not seeing the eyes at all. And then you could even play with, okay, so maybe we'll let you see the glints in his eyes, but not the eye detail itself. Um, but that, that looks a little too strong. So you might decide as you did to leave them out, but I wouldn't, I'd, I'd go with a darker shadow like this. It helps really give that, um, uh, it makes it more foreboding. It gives the extra uh, volume to the uh, helmet because it's casting the shadow down on his face. And then you do have, this isn't the nose, this is a nose guard. And the fact that that black line goes all the way across makes it look more like he's got like a zinc on his nose or something. So you might want to kill the white line there, but that this is getting more nit nitpicky. And yeah, it's more of a des you know design decision than anything else at that point. So that's it. That's the um, that handles the big thing and the um, the most important uh, elements. Everything else isn't bad at all. Uh, I will say. Let me just do one more save. Um, it is a good idea when you're. Uh, remember how I said about silhouette. This character has a high enough resolution that you can really start to let me create another layer. In fact. Um, all right, so I'm working on a new layer. Yep. All right, so I'm going to use this ugly green color again and draw on the screen here. So just as I said, keep the actual, I forgot pressure sensitivity is turned on, so I should keep this brush small and press very lightly. Uh, hold on a second. All right, so keep that curve in mind of the sort of volume of his chest. But always think of S curves and curves and counter curves when you're drawing a human body. And um, so it, this is especially true for the silhouette of this leg here, the leg on the right of the image or his left leg. Uh, you want to emphasize a curve going outward for the th upper thigh and then emphasize uh, the opposite curve for the shin. And that's going to uh, help things look more dynamic and organic at the same time. So you could potentially, oops, I'm gonna go back to using a mouse. Um, you could potentially let this relatively tight fitting thing stay a little truer to the position of the thighs, but then go back to the, um, so, I mean, it looks like, and that's the other thing about, like I said, about um, letting things, if you have a detail, help it stand out, help it have a distinct silhouette. And right now, this sort of cloth skirt and these um, hip guards, they seem to have the exact same length. So uh, you can decide, I was starting to make it the, the skirt longer than it, but you could decide to make the skirt shorter than it and give it a nice, uh, more natural, um, that's too strong, but um, that way you can show a little bit of the the legs under there and help emphasize the difference between those two elements. So just as a general idea, something like that. All right. Uh, and then potentially bring this foot. Oh, that's right. I'm on the other layer. Darn it. I'm really making a mess now. Yeah, bring this foot back a little bit. There we go. So now we're starting to get that S curve sort of thing going on. And then same thing here, you might want to give this a little bit more peak or curve here and then let it go down 
and then find that edge of it, let it have its own silhouette, and then cut in with the shadow here to give you your leg, and then you can something like that. Help separate those different parts. I don't like the fact that I made the leg the same color as this fabric here, but we'll just cast a shadow on that for now to hide it since I don't have a lot of time. And then let's see if we have a sort of highlight color to, uh, since the light's coming from this side, we can just cast a highlight. Oops, sorry about that. Hitting the wrong keys today. Oh, that's the two layer thing causing me issues. That's what it is. All right, so maybe cast a highlight on that fabric to give it some dimension. So that's the general idea. Like I'm really going uh, overboard with the general feedback, but you get the idea. Let, let each thing have its own size and shape and silhouette. Um, try to make sure things don't end up looking too much, uh, too many straight lines, uh, kind of stove pipey. Make sure forearms, especially in very muscular men, are very thick at the, let's see, <laughs> very thick at the uh, at the thickest part and then tapered to a, th a thinner uh, wrist. And it's the same thing with the lower legs here. Uh, the calves are where it should be its most uh, round and then it should taper to a considerably thinner ankle. Something like that in general. Oh yeah, and then you could, I'm not sure exactly what's happening with the anatomy of these hip guards, but it's uh, it could be a good idea to have the um, have the silhouette actually represent this sort of um, scaling or rib type um, something like that. Since you have the resolution for it, it can really add a lot of uh, character, a lot of additional texture to the overall silhouette. So uh, yeah, that's it. That was that was the gist of it. Um, I don't want to repeat myself too much. I hope this was helpful uh, to you, and thank you very much, uh, Juan, to um, letting me use this uh, video, uh, let, letting me use this art uh, to make a video for everyone. Hopefully, uh, a lot of people benefit from this. And thanks everyone for watching.